A team at play from the Julie squad, a group of young police officers who together smashed the biggest, the richest drug ring ever established in Britain. To do it, they gave a year of their lives. Families, homes, friends and relations were sacrificed as they matched their wits against a team of highly skilled scientists, doctors, academics and businessmen who for seven long years made millions of pounds out of the sale and manufacture of the mind-expanding drug LSD. The ancient goals which we follow can be defined in modern terms, in the metaphors of the present, as turn on, tune in, and drop out. In those few simple words from Dr. Timothy Leary lay the origins of the problem the Julie squad had to deal with. At Millbrook in upstate New York in the early 60s, Dr. Leary developed an ideology that spread out to reach millions of young people all over the world. His brotherhood of eternal love, as it was eventually called, argued that the use of LSD broadened the mind, made man more tolerant of his neighbor, less violent. The Brotherhood believed that if enough people took LSD, society would change for the better. And in the climate of the times, Dr. Leary's ideas found a ready response. In the United States, the demand for acid, as it came to be known, grew as the 60s progressed to the alarm of the authorities. In 1967, they decided to call a halt to Dr. Leary's activities. LSD was made illegal, the Brotherhood was driven underground, and its supporters on the defensive. One of them, David Solomon, had been a friend and colleague of Dr. Leary's for years. He had edited several books about drugs, including LSD. But now, with the substance prescribed, he was having problems publishing material. So, in 1967, Solomon and his family came to England, to Cambridge. He was soon mixing in the fringe academic side of university life, propagating the ideas of the Brotherhood, writing articles in papers and magazines. Then one day in early 1969, still here in Cambridge, Solomon was introduced to a brilliant young chemist from Liverpool University, Richard Kemp. It wasn't long before Kemp was meeting others in Solomon's circle, learning the Brotherhood's drug techniques. A number of the early production runs were done here at the old vicarage at Linton, just outside Cambridge, where Solomon lived for a while. It was soon apparent that the Brotherhood had recruited a first-class chemist. But the organization by now had lost much of its idealism. In fact, it was being run by those who were little more than criminal racketeers. Solomon's role in this is described by police as that of a joiner, somebody who brings important people together. Among those he introduced was Henry Barclay Todd, who worked on a pig farm nearby. He was a computer expert who quickly grasped the possibilities of mass marketing LSD. Another person at this time was Richard Kemp's girlfriend, Christine Bott. She was a qualified doctor of medicine who believed people would be happier if they turned on to LSD, one of the most powerful drugs in the world. These yellow and green ones are the famous domes and the little black ones are the microdots. Any one of these little packets contains about a thousand doses of LSD. So here there's something like 700,000 doses of LSD, every one of which can be made for just a few pence, but sold on the streets for anything from a pound upwards. Now, LSD is a drug which affects the chemicals which carry messages from one brain cell to another. So when you take LSD, you change your perception of yourself and your relation to the universe around you. It doesn't make you see pink elephants outside you. It changes your view of your position in the universe. Now, quite unpredictably, this can be either very nice or it can be absolutely nasty, causing those terrible panic feelings. LSD isn't addictive. You virtually can't poison yourself with it. But in a few cases, it does, in fact, drive people mad can make them go and kill other people or themselves. There are several ways of making LSD, several different chemical routes. But the one that's most usually used by people who make this drug illegally starts from the substance called, called 
ergotamine tartrate. Now, that's a natural substance produced by a fungus which grows on rye. You can't practically buy it in this country, but you can buy it on the continent. So Solomon and Todd began to set up a network abroad to bring back the agotamine tartrate Kemp needed to produce the LSD. One of the firms they used was Dolders here in Baal in Switzerland. Todd established Fine Organics Limited as the bogus company through which he would make his purchases. Its address was given as 11 Rue Scribe in Paris, which is in fact the offices of the American Express Company. The orders were usually limited to three kilos of agotamine, enough to make three million LSD tablets. The name Todd chose for himself was John Weber. He formed a second company, Interorganics, also based in Paris, to make further purchases. To allay suspicions, the letter included orders for vitamin and hormone tablets, as well as the orgotamine. A third identity was that of Peter Hollander of Johannesburg. Using this name, Todd visited the factory in person. The order was worth nearly £9,000, which Todd paid for in cash. It will be said by some people that perhaps you yourself should have been stricter in who you dealt with. No, you see, it's really a product which is, uh, there is no control, no, uh, no license necessary. Everybody can buy it and sell it. So it's absolutely impossible for us to, uh, to check where some material is going, who is purchasing, and so on. With the agotamine tartrate bought on the continent, Kemp began to produce extremely high quality LSD. First at an illegal laboratory in Paris, later in England, literally working out of a suitcase at various rented flats. By now, the demand for his product was staggering. It's reckoned that in the early 70s, the high point of the pop festival phenomenon, that 100,000 LSD tablets a week were being taken in Britain. Drug squad officers say the demand for LSD at this time was even greater than the demand for cannabis. Sellers came onto the scene offering microdots, domes, sugar lumps, tablets to a generation eager to experiment. But by 1973, the Brotherhood was in trouble. In the United States, the Drug Enforcement Agency had cracked down. People were beginning to talk. The first clue came from Canada, where a man was picked up after a drug squad raid on the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. This man said that the bulk of top-grade LSD came from Britain, and he mentioned three names, Richard Kemp, Christine Bott, and a man called Henry. This information went to the Central Drug Intelligence Unit at Scotland Yard. At the same time, scientists here at the Home Office Central Research Establishment at Aldermaston were monitoring police seizures of LSD from all over Britain ever since 1969. It started appearing in about 1970. I think 4% of the LSD seizures were what of this one particular type, the microdot. And then they uh, grew and grew and grew until about 75, there were 83% of the LSDs on the market. How did you decide that there was just one factory producing it? Um, well, there was only one up to 73. And how did you know that? Because of the size, shape, colour, colour sequences. We could see there was system in it. It changed every few months. And, uh, uh, and the fillers. And then there came two factories. Yes, there was a break in 73, and uh, a different type of microdot appeared, uh, and also the domes. And they were of different composition, but they were obviously related to the original one, so our guess was there were then two labs. Two laboratories because by 1974 the acid team had split. Kemp bought this remote cottage near Tregaron in Mid Wales and came here with Bott to get away from possible police interference. The area suited them well. It was isolated, there was no drug squad, and they could get on with producing the enormous amounts of LSD they were now being asked to supply. For their new laboratory, they found an ideal location, a mansion at Carno, about an hour's drive from their cottage. An American member of the Brotherhood, Paul Anabaldi, actually bought the place. 
Back in London, meanwhile, a few months later, Kemp's former associate, Henry Todd, set up another, less sophisticated factory at Seymour Road. As chemists, they press ganged into service another remarkable young man. Andy Munro had been school captain, English school's discus champion, and graduated at Cambridge. But when it came to producing LSD, he was highly inefficient and spent most of his time high during production runs. Brian Cuthbertson became Henry Todd's adjutant. He was a mathematics student at Reading University and a first-rate classical pianist. He developed the techniques of the Brotherhood into an elaborate and effective distribution system. Cuthbertson's system involved storing the LSD tablets in so-called dead letter boxes in remote woodland. One in particular was here at Pangbourne near Reading. What happened was that the distributors never dealt directly with the manufacturers. They would have to phone the ring's banker who would say where the tablets were buried. Then the distributors would be told to follow a series of marks on the trees which would lead to the storage point in the heart of the wood. The drugs were packaged in plastic bags inside containers. These 670,000 tablets were recovered from Pangborn, which at the time was the biggest LSD find in the world. At street value, this lot alone was worth nearly a million pounds. By now, the team were making vast amounts of money, a good deal of it going into Swiss bank accounts in Zurich and Geneva. Todd and Kemp made at least 20 trips to Zurich, traveling under their own names. Surprisingly, perhaps, none of the team ever made any effort to cover their tracks in Switzerland, which has made some skeptical policemen suspect that their activities were something they could afford to have discovered. The point about the profit from LSD, of course, and where it differs from other drugs, is that the financial power lies with the men who make it. So, as the money flowed in and out of Switzerland in ever-increasing quantities, what was life like for those getting the benefit? It was an interesting life and it was exciting. We travelled a lot. Brian Cuthbertson's um, wife, Jo. We did lots of things. We didn't discuss um, LSD very much at all. It was just like any kind of business. You just get on with it and you separate the rest of your life from it. Very much so. What about extravagant spending? Extravagant spending. Um, well, in our situation, it was mainly spent on travelling, not so much um, extravagant living. Did I you entertain say. friends? We well, yes, we did. At our home, um, meals, just in just London? as anybody would who is successful in a business. Yes, in London and in France. You don't think your lifestyle is any more extravagant, perhaps? And no, I don't. Not any more than friends of ours who have successful, legitimate businesses. What about uh, the reports of uh, the chateau that you had bought in, in France? Well, it's not a chateau, for a start. It's uh, called a master's house, and it's, in fact, equivalent to a manor house, I suppose, in England. It was very dilapidated when we bought it and we spent most of our time working on it ourselves. We just worked solidly on it while we were there. It was our home. Why didn't they accept the money they'd already made, which had been substantial, and call it a day? I'm not even sure that it was the money. I think that because people wanted this, this substance and, and because it was so well organized, or they thought it was, um, they, they just carried on doing it. And I suppose they, they also found it exciting. Um, the, the fact that it, the operation went so smoothly each time as the years went on, I suppose it got more organized, easier to do, and uh, just got larger and larger until they were... Did they enjoy take... ...trapped into a situation, but... It would be very difficult to get out of something that was so smooth running. But that smooth running pattern was soon to be broken. In 1974, Detective Chief Inspector Richard Lee, who's now left the police to write a book about his experiences, was head of the Thames Valley Drug Squad. One day, one of his undercover men brought in a man who had offered him a huge consignment of LSD. 
Lee told his detective to release the man and to follow him. Eventually, he surfaced in mid Wales in the village of Clandui Brevi. There, they watched the man's movements, noted who he met, and then arrested him. He was taken to Aberystwyth Police Station for questioning. In the police yard, quite by chance, was a Range Rover registered in the name of one Richard Kemp, a name Lee knew from files made up after the tip-off from Canada. The vehicle had been taken to Aberystwyth after a fatal road accident. Lee told his man to search it. He spent about six hours uh, stripping this vehicle out. He found six pieces of tiny screwed up pieces of paper, which when flattened out measured about a quarter of an inch square. When put together, they spelt the word hydrazine hydrate, which is the name of a chemical, which is a key one in the production of LSD. And this, in fact, was the first evidence found in the United Kingdom, firm evidence, um, that there was an acid team and that Kemp and Bott were involved. To deal with the clues Lee had unearthed, in February 1976, Detective Chief Superintendent Dennis Greenslade was put in charge of a special LSD drug squad. 28 especially picked men and women from 11 different police forces were seconded to join him. Their terms of reference were to locate the LSD laboratory, identify the manufacturers and the major distributors. They based themselves at Devizes in Wiltshire and set about their daunting task. To identify themselves, they took the name of one of their number, Julie Taylor, a local sergeant. Operation Julie had a name. The man chosen to direct the operation was Richard Lee. For someone who had done so much to get the operation off the ground, it was a satisfying, though obviously demanding, outcome. As soon as he knew he was to take over, he went straight to Wales to start inquiries. Having got the go-ahead, the first thing I'd got to do was to find out what Kemp and Bott were doing. They were living here, in this lonely cottage, in the middle of Wales. But how were we going to get close to these two to find out what they were doing? We looked at this and decided we would use a, an empty cottage, holiday cottage, further down the lane. Decided to put four of the officers in, disguised as fishermen, fishing in the uh, rivers uh, in the locality. Lee then turned his attention to the mansion at Carno, bought by the American Anna Baldy. Kemp and Bott had been visiting it Lee decided to watch the place closely. We decided, in fact, to hire a caravan from a public works contractor, um, put five men into it, posing as surveyors, looking for new coal seams in the hills around. Um, these men posted themselves letters, so the postman got to know them. They chatted with the milkmen and in the pubs round about to broadcast that they were here. At the end of the first week, it was obvious that something of highly significant was happening in this building. Kemp would be driven up by bot from Tregoran. He would be, he would stay here two days, in which time we wouldn't see him. He would emerge worn out, ashen, tired. She would drive him back to Tregoran. He would rest there for the day and then come back here. This was repeated through the week. We were 95% certain the laboratory was here. But if we moved then, all we would have was the laboratory and the people running the laboratory. We would not have the tableter, the distribution network, and the people supplying the chemicals. We decided to wait and let it run for a year. Having decided not to move, we then sat it out. We traced Annabaldi leaving here and going out through uh, Southampton to Spain. We waited for Kemp and Bott to go to Tregoran. When they were there, I gave the order to the watching team, break in. We've got to satisfy ourselves one way or the other. And they came. And they came down here. As they got into the building, dirt, filth everywhere. In the cellar, they had to climb over a mountain of debris, walls filthy, and suddenly they turned the corner 
and they find this. Clean walls, ceiling, smooth floors, and in here, most important of all, a drain. But what Lee and his men didn't find was a full working laboratory. Kemp and Bott had already buried most of the equipment in the garden outside, having just completed a massive production run. Ironically, the detectives had noticed this unusual activity in the garden, but it was only later that they realised its significance. Still, there was plenty of evidence left to show what had been going on. We estimate that in here, he made, Kemp made, about 20 million dosage units, or 20 million doses of LSD. Certainly one of the major illicit LSD laboratories ever found anywhere in the world. This cellar, this grossy little cellar in Mid Wales, was the centre of a worldwide organisation capable of bringing the Agotomy Tartar from Switzerland, assembling the equipment, manufacturing this vast amount, which they tableted, and then found its way onto the streets of Sydney, Amsterdam, the Far East, India, sometimes America, France and Germany. Kemp and Bott were the key. If we were to find out or to discover the rest of the distribution organisation, we had got to stay close to those two. And had got to stay close to them in mid Wales with all the difficulties that that entailed. Obviously, our holiday cottage could not maintain the cover for a year or more. We'd got to think of something else. The alternative that we came up with was this farmer house here, which was ideal for our purposes. Isolated, some two and a half miles from the uh, town, yet near enough to move in when we wanted to. Not overlooked, plenty of outbuildings where we could hide our vehicles. So, one had to establish a cover for our presence here. Bear in mind this sparsely populated area, strangers in the, uh, here caused comment uh, almost straight away. And one could not risk that comment getting over to Kemp and Bot. So, to, the cover story was that uh, I would be called Calvert. I was the owner of an import-export business that had just sustained a nervous breakdown following a separation in my marriage. One then went into uh, Tregoran, because here one had got to bring this story home to the people as quickly as possible. So you pick the centre of the community, and the centre of that community is the back bar of the Talbot Public House. I, with David Redrup, a colleague who came up with me, we spent a fortnight here uh, establishing uh, our identity, listening to the gossip. Here we were, um, kidding people, deceiving people, who were wanting to help. Uh, and it wasn't easy uh, for either of us. But nevertheless, it had to be done. We'd hired the cottage for a month, and then we were going to say we liked the area so much that I would retain the cottage, use it for occasional weekends, but also allow my employees of the company to come up and spend uh, some periods, holiday periods with the wives, etc. So this gave the story that strangers in the area could come and go without causing comment. Uh, and of course, the most valuable asset, as far as we were concerned, was over that hill, is a perfect view of Kemp and Bott's cottage. This hill uh, is of interest because it's one of the few places in Britain where one can see the very rare bird, the kite. And of course this was a stroke of luck for us because occasionally shepherds and farmers do come up here. Whenever they did, the officers were able to use the uh, story of looking for the kite as a cover or an excuse for being here. But this did, in fact, backfire on us on one occasion where the two young officers from Bournemouth were up here and they met a chappie, uh, they got into conversation and it transpired uh, he was, in fact, uh, taking a PhD in ornithology with a special emphasis on kites. <laughs> Needless to say, the only thing they were left to talk about was the inclement weather. 
Anyway, having arrived up here, the officers would then lie in the fold in the ground here. Um, in the bad weather, they brought up a small ridge tent, but unfortunately, being in such an exposed uh, position, it was of very little use. Uh, it certainly didn't keep them dry. They were using an advanced technology uh, high-powered telescope uh, viewing across the valley to Kempenbot's cottage, which is the grey stone uh, building with the white door on the other side of the valley. You can also see a, a white caravan in the paddock below the house. Although Kempenbot were doing nothing, the fact that they were doing nothing was of interest to me because I knew that he had produced LSD at Kano. Where was that LSD? We needed to know. Kemp did not move from that cottage. He did not have any activity anywhere else. So therefore, the likelihood of what we were looking for was to be found there. But in fact, it was the activity at Seymour Road that finally convinced the police to move against the drugs ring. Detectives there too had been watching the place around the clock for months. In the first week of March, they saw Munro trying to get rid of equipment at a rubbish dump at Reading. They learned that the milk had been cancelled and that a number of tickets had been bought for the Bahamas. So the decision to go in was made and immediately it was obvious that the laboratory was indeed being dismantled. As well as dozens of bottles of the chemical required to make LSD, there were 23,000 pounds in notes. The house at Seymour Road was so impregnated with LSD that one of the officers who went inside went on a trip himself. I myself felt the experience that I was walking on a very soft platform. Um, lights appeared uh, better. Um, I could hear the water in the drains, this sort of thing. Um, and for my part, it was a, not a frightening experience. But one of the officers definitely um, felt a, a persecution complex. In fact, he felt uh, that he was being looked at, stared at, and perhaps followed by people. When uh, the police finally broke in early on that Saturday morning, how did they react when they realised that it was all over? They were remarkably calm about it. I think possibly they knew in the back of their minds that you can't do something for seven years and, and just get away with it. Um, that the more you do something, the more you're pushing your luck. And that possibly, subconsciously, they felt that one day the crunch would come. That crunch involved the biggest police operation ever mounted. 800 officers raided 87 houses all over Britain. In all, 122 people were arrested. Over a million tablets were recovered and enough material taken to make another 15 million. It was the biggest drugs haul ever made. With Operation Duly Over, the lengthy legal proceedings began. But a number of intriguing questions remain unanswered. Firstly, what's become of the money? Police believe they've only recovered a tenth. Certainly, nearly half a million pounds was found in the Swiss bank accounts of Todd and Cuthbertson. And a further hundred thousand pounds in cash was found in Britain. But at a conservative estimate, this group netted over 20 million pounds. Secondly, there's the matter of the missing LSD. It's thought that a million and a half tablets from the last production run at Seymour Road are unaccounted for. We understand that the police are investigating the possibility of a third chain that runs from Britain to West Germany and that some of the material may have gone that way. So, at the end of it all, what began as an idealistic dream that would turn on an entire generation has ended in the harsh reality of Bristol Crown Court. The severity of the sentences handed down on these defendants are a measure of the authorities' concern that millions of young people were at risk. As for the police, the experience they regained over the past three years will not be forgotten, even if some of the lessons were painfully learnt. In the end, Operation Julie was a success. A success because policemen from chief constables down to constables, cooperated and worked together to tackle the acid problem in Britain. They created a national drug squad, because that is what Julie was, but on a temporary basis, 
We cannot afford to lose the expertise these men gained in this operation. But what a waste also of the talented people now facing long terms of imprisonment. Kemp, a chemist of world stature. Charney and Bott could have made excellent GPs. Cuthbertson, a brilliant musician. Todd, a computer expert. They thought they wanted to improve society. If only they'd used their talents within the rules, what a different picture it might have been. Well, I certainly can't remember anything that I've either read about or been involved in of anything near this scale. 800 police officers acting simultaneously at 5 a.m. on the 26th of March and executing some 83 search warrants issued under the Misuse of Drugs Act of 71. Tremendous operation. In addition to um, the warrants that were executed here in England and Scotland and Wales, we also had, of course, help from the French police, the John Darmory. Do you think the case is now being made for a national drug you, squad? Or my own personal view is that we should have regional support services, not only for drugs, but also for fraud, for stolen motor vehicles and for special branch. And it would be a relatively easy matter to attach um, officers with expertise in the field of drugs, dangerous drugs I'm talking about now, to the regional crime squads. We already have the command structure we have the office accommodation, we have the vehicles, and we have the expertise in surveillance techniques. And in fact, we train people. In